There again, folks, this is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. This particular excerpt right here is going to be for mothers. Uh, back when my wife was alive, I had bought her a Bible several years ago. It's called the Woman's Study Bible. It's a King James Version, and it's put out for women. Because of my inability to pronounce names the way I really ought to, I'm going to actually hold this Bible up with the names of the women that put it together. And these are all notable women. Actually, I've had the opportunity of knowing some of these women through the years. And perhaps you have too. And I'm going to, you'll have to blow it up on your screen, but I'm going to put it up uh, in front here. And, uh, yeah, try to get a picture of it the best I can uh, right here and scan it a little bit so you can look these up. Now, I'm sure in this day and age of modern women that you have the ability to get in your computer and look this book up and see it was written in 1995 by Thomas Nelson. I would recommend you get one. You say, well, Brother Peter, I can get it on the YouTube. I can look at it in my computer without buying the book. I'm going to tell you this. There's something different about handling the book. It's a total different matter about handling the book. If you married a woman and you got put cameras in your house, and the only time you see that woman, you don't turn the camera on and you look at that woman. I say, that's my wife. That would be an awful impersonable marriage, would it not? It would be very impersonal, wouldn't it? Well, that's the way I feel about the Bible. To be reading it or studying it or just doing it on the computer is impersonal. You want to be personal about it? Pick it up. Open the book. This is God's book. These are God's, God's words in here. This is God's writing. This is his instructions to you. You can hold in your hand. You can open up page by page by page. You can get up in the morning and say, Lord, I really need something today. Would you show me something that I really need? Take your fingers. And start flipping the pages. Like this right here. Flip the pages. And say, Lord, I need... I'm right there. Let me look and see what I need. He said, trust in Him at all times. You people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Do I need that? Yes, I need that. I, I really need that. I'm on the 19th day that my, my wife passed away, 19 days ago. And at 55 years we were married. I need that. You say, Brother Peter, could you open up any other place and find something? Yes, I could. But this is the one I need right now. I need that. Trust in Him at all times. My children have been chiding me, Dad. Be careful. Don't jump. Don't run. Don't make r any rash, uh, rational uh, ideas or things. Don't let them go. Take your time. Ask the Lord. Ask this Lord that you say you're trusting in Him. And pour your heart out before Him. For He is your refuge. Not advice from other people. That's not your refuge. Not advice from other secular books. That's another refuge. But use God for your refuge. Now this, this uh, uh, book, uh, this one I'm going to read this morning, where I'm going to read today for you mothers out of this Bible. And it was first printed in 82 for women. Uh, 
It also had a printing in 79. And it's a very, very good book. A trinity. What is a trinity? A trinity is a three cornered thing. It's like when you first got married, uh, there were two of you in the house. You had your first child. Now there's three in the house. You have a trinity, a mother, father, and a child. And you can go further. But that's a picture, one, two, three. That's a picture outside of the body, soul, and spirit of what a trinity is. You're in one house, you're one family. You're mom, dad, and child. And you're a family. That's what a trinity is. And, and a, a, a father and a mother, or a husband and a wife, need God in their life to make out the third part of their trinity. A marriage is a tr triune thing. It's not just a, me and you. Hey, it's going to be my way today. And she said, no, it's not. It's going to be my way today. Now you got the wrong kind of a trinity. you got a bad attitude in there. You need to get that attitude out of there. And he said, I'm going to do this today. And wife, if you don't agree with that, you might say to your husband, have you really thought about that? <clears throat> I got a son. He's, he's, a, he's a thinker. A little more unusual than me. He's a little better, better thinker than I ever was. And he'll say to me, Dad, have you thought about that? You think about what you just said? You think of what the results might be from that kind of action? Everything has results. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk to you ladies, you women that are mothers, about the results of your child. The results of what kind of man he's going to be, or what kind of woman she's going to be, is going to be in your hands right now. What you do right now with your three, four-year-old child is going to be what they're going to be like when they're 30 or 40 years old. What kind of people they're going to be or when they're 13 or 14 years old. This trinity carries on. And if you have, you instill in your children to have God be the third part in their life, throughout their life, and train them up in the way a child should go, and they'll not depart from it. Oh, they may have some bumps. The tricarta, from a Latin word meaning three cornered. That's tricarta, meaning three cornered, from the Latin. Is an ancient symbol for the Trinity. It comprises three interwoven arches. That is what is used. Uh, many times you see that used. It is distinct, yet it is equal. It is an inspirational symbol. And uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three distinct yet equal persons in individual oneness, God. You and I are a body, a soul, and a spirit. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are one. 
My body, my soul, and my spirit are one. You're looking at one person that's three people. And when you look at God, you're looking at a God that's three persons. He is the Father, He is the Son, and He is the Holy Spirit. And those three are equal. In this tricarda, I don't see the, the tricarda. Oh, here it is right here. Uh, drawn. You can look it up. Look up tricarda with your computer. You can look it up. Uh, if you buy this Bible, it'll be right on the front page. It'll be the first page in. Listen to this right here in the, in the forwardness. Praise God. Wow. We need to just praise God for everything. But we need to praise Him for the history as it is recorded in the Word. My sincere prayer that this volume will become a tool to guide you in listening to the voice of God as He speaks through His Word. I would, if, if I was you, and I'm not you, but my advice to you would be, put all things aside for the next week. Find this Bible by Thomas Nelson for women, a study Bible. This one in particular is the King James Version in particular and it's uh, for the woman I was trying to find it. Thomas Nelson Publishers and I would get the 1995 version 1995 and uh, the thrill of hearing God speak how do you hear God speak? do you want to begin to hear God speak? You get his word out. And you'll hear him speak. You'll hear him speak today. You'll have you'll understand when he did speak the spoken word before it was printed. And that was before. And it will always be spoken word afterward. We were just talking about a trinity. The before, the now, and the afterward. The three things that are here today, what well, we say here today and gone tomorrow. For this old book, the Holy Word has not left me. It has been life-changing. This is a life-changing book, but it's only life-changing if you use it. However, for many, the Bible may be sometimes a closed door. Its stories are all fairly familiar. There seems to be a great void of understanding exactly what these stories can mean for Christian living in the present day. Now you've got to get your mind right. You get your mind to past, present, and future, and the stories of this Bible hold water or their validity is still as good today as it was when the story was done. When the personage that was uh, talked about was alive, and you're reading about them now, you're seeing where their high points were, their good points, you're seeing where they may have had a low point in life and a failure. But they came through it. And it's penned down for you and I to see that we can learn from other people where God was in their life and how if they left God out, what happened to their life? True happiness is not in houses and lands, nice cars. True happiness is not in worldly education. True happiness is in godliness. The third part of a person's happiness is godliness. 
Breathing's a good part. That's good, isn't it? You cut that off, you're a dead person. Well, if you don't have God in your life, you like not breathing. You're like a dead person in a sense of the word. But when you get God in your life, you become alive in Him. And when you're alive in Him, He can guide and lead you and direct you. First of all, you must prove to yourself you're alive in Him. The very simple prayer of saying, Lord, Jesus, I am a sinner. I don't care how good you are. You are a sinner. And saying, God, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save my soul. You cannot read this book as a sinner and have it come and dwell in you and fill you up or give you your day's peace and joy or whatever. The only way you can do it is by, by having him in your heart. He's the one that is the third part of your understanding. You have a head and a body and a heart. But the only way you can understand God is to have him in your heart. That's the part that makes you join up with him forever. If you don't have that third part, you have an empty well inside of you that will be filled by the devil with everything that comes along. Yeah, he can fill you with good looking things. You can be a good looking person, like, man, I don't think, man, that guy right there, he's something else or she's something else. They are good people. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. A real good person is a godly person. If it's not godly, it's not good. So, let's get back in the book. Enough of that uh, chiding for right now. Many people who read God's word, believe it. They just don't believe it works for them today. I just got done, that's what I just got done saying. But it does. You will find the factual information in the introductory material. The topical notes, uh, it's like dictation, but it's annotation. The topical notes, the portraits, the charts, the maps. In the Woman's Study Bible, to be helpful in showing you how it works. It has all of the introduction pages on it that you need to see how to get into this book and receive it. Now you can get into it, but you don't receive it without God. Now these ladies were godly ladies that put this together. Truth does not change. 2 Timothy 3.16 While experts in science, technology, geology, and the all of the ologies are constantly changing their fi findings and conclusions. <laughs> Woo, isn't that something? What's true in all of the ologies today may not be true tomorrow. Why? Because they found out something more about the ology. The ology of, I was just talking with my friend about coughing, about his lungs. The ology of lungs. I have a book out here right now I've been studying about how to speak. Where does it come from? What's down in here? What is down in here? You get that diagram and see what's down in here. You can see it on the diagram and then it shows you in the book how to use it. How to use a different, different thing from down here. Use it bring it up, something important to say. And then different language, different things. That's why we can have all different languages and people can speak all different languages. We all have the same mechanism, but we use it in different ways. 
Well, this Bible is for that. Even though it was written thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago, various uh, challenges may be made to the historical accounts found in the Bible. But you're going to be excited as you begin to read reasonable explanations for many of your questions. We could say right there, our questions. Because they're not just yours. It's everybody's questions. And you know what's a funny thing? I watched a little thing the other day. Jerry Fowler, uh, it was at his, a college thing, and he had, oh, 50, 75 students in front of him. And they were asking him biblical questions. And he was answering them. And the truth of the matter is, that's where the answer for all your biblical questions are. It's in the Bible. <laughs> you can find them. Uh, there will be, of course, be some things that are still mysterious of God, for which there are no answers at this time, in this life. The challenge of those mysteries will lead you to worship a God whose ways are past finding out, whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Romans 11, 33. And Romans, Isaiah 55 and 9. What you need to do is every time you pick this book up, is have your little prayer, you say and mean it, which is God, open my eyes that I might see him in a fresh way. Open my ears that I might hear his voice speaking to me as I read this book. That I might understand his words and let the woman's study Bible be my guide. Ladies, you need to get this book. You need to get this book. Let's look at Proverbs 22. <clears throat> A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. All the wealth of the world, it can be nice, but it can also be not so nice. If you don't have the ability to handle it properly. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Number four, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the, per of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be far from them. If you guard your soul, you'll be far from the snares and the thorns. This is page 1060 in this woman's Bible. It is Proverbs chapter 22. This Proverbs chapter 22 is in any Bible. Every Bible has it. You need to use a King James Version and look at it. Then you can look at any other version you want. But you need to read it first in your King James Version. And make sure that by somebody retranslating it, they haven't taken away the meaning of it. I have many 
many Bibles. This is a dake. This Bible here, I've studied it. Every single page on it, every page on it, I've studied it in the notes. And I have several different ones by different. This is from Dake. I've studied it from cover to cover. <coughs> this, this right here is my Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. Uh, and I've studied it from cover to cover. And I'm still working on it. And, and I be very careful. A little, a little Bible to carry just the Holy Word of God. This is uh, uh, how to use a reference in the Bible put out by somebody. Uh, but Thomas Nelson printed it. And uh, I forgot who put this out. Was this Jerry Fowles? Uh, I don't remember. But anyway, I have many college Bibles from different colleges across the nation who put out the Word of God. <clears throat> and uh, they're very interesting. This is a whole Bible right here. And it's the King James Version. And uh, a guy by the name, it's put out by Thomas Nelson. And a guy by Jimmy Swag put this together and put it out on the market. And so we can take these Bibles and if they all say King James Version, they all write the exact same. As long as they say King James Version, they're all the same. Let's clarify that. What is the importance of using the King James Version? If you pick up any Bible that says King James Version, they're all the same. There's no difference in them. But if you pick up one that says all kinds of different names on it, we won't call any names. But I have a bookcase in here with all of those names lined up. All of those Bibles lined up. I can take this Proverbs 22 and read it to you out of one of those retranslations. And it will not say the exact same thing. You got a hammer, and you got a nail. The nail's got a head. You hit on the head of that nail to drive it in to a board. You can take that hammer and hit that nail any way you want to besides the head. You know what's going to happen? You're not going to drive the nail. The Bible's the same way. You change any word of it and you're not going to get the same answer. When God put this Bible together, he anointed it. He anointed this King James Version. He anointed it. You go back and study it. People gave their lives. One behind the other gave their lives to print this. <coughs> Why is it called the King James Version? Because there was a king over there. His name was James. There was a group of people wanting to translate this Bible. There was another group of people wanting to kill those people that wanted to translate this Bible. So they appealed to the king, his name was James, and said, would you sanction us and give us a room and a place, put soldiers around it, so that those folks that want to kill us can't kill us. We will lock ourselves in that building. We will go days without food and water. We'll go days without the, the uh, necessities of life to get this Bible printed. And the king says, I can see. You're serious. And he says, yes, we are. You, king, will get the first copy. When it's done, you will get the first copy. The power of God came on those men. They siphoned, and they, they got parchments, and they dug in, and they dug in, and they sat around the round table, and they had a union, and they decided every little scratch in the Word was decided by a group of godly men with God in their presence, and they pinned it down for you and I. We pick it up. We frivolously use it. 
We throw it around. We light, lightly read it. We don't give it much. Look, you're reading a book that was uh, uh, written in blood. People gave their lives to pen down what's here. They gave their lives. Think of the books that Paul the Apostle wrote. He wrote uh, many of them from prison. They call the prison epistles. He wrote them from prison. <clears throat> you think that that's a good place to be writing the Bible? In prison? With guards? In chains? And, and, and having a, a, a not comfortable time? Pinning down God's word. Listen, this Bible was written in blood, just like the United States of America is here today. Blood was shed for America to be here today. We would not be here today except for the blood that was shed in all of the wars that we've had. The majority of the wars we've had have been called righteous wars. The First and Second World War were righteous wars. What were we fighting to do? We were fighting to keep a godless country from taking over a God country. We, was, we're, we were founded in the name of God. In God we trust. says it on our money. In God we trust. But we had other countries who wanted to come over here and knock our God out of the system and take over. And we said, not on your life. You ain't doing it. So we fought them. That's a righteous war. So we fought some righteous war. And then we thought we, we, we have fought some wrong wars. It's best in life to fight the righteous wars and leave those other wars alone. Let's go on. Train up a child, it said, in the way he should go. And when he is old, <clears throat> he will not depart from it. The rich rules over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. He who shows <coughs> uh, iniquity will reap sorrow. And the rod of anger will fall. He who has a generous eye will be blessed. For he gives of his bread to the poor. Cast out the scoffer, and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. The eye of the Lord preserves knowledge. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. To get the eyes of the Lord on you and in your life, you need to have this book. But he overthrows the words of the faithless. In order to be faithful, you have to have this book. The lazy man says, there is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. The mouth of the immoral woman is a deep pit. He who <clears throat> is abhorred by the Lord will fall there. If you don't have the Lord in your life and you're a man, you can fall at that abhorred woman. But if you have God in your life, he'll show you the difference between that abhorred woman and a chaste woman. You're a man out here in, the, in this world today. It's very difficult to find a chaste woman. Let's get off that subject. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. <clears throat> but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. <clears throat> you, wouldn't you know that I would pick up a Bible with a page 
that got a wrinkle in it. He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich will surely come to poverty. We need to be sing and we need to sing and say the sayings of the wise. Here's one right here. Verse 17. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Mothers, <clears throat> I'm talking to you mothers. Take this Psalm 22. Pick out some verses that you could sing to your little child. And you could sing this one. Incline your ears and make up a little song. And hold your hand on your ears like this. Incline your ears. And hear the words of the wise. And sing it. And apply your heart. And put your hand here and show them where your heart is. And apply your heart to my knowledge, says God. And God's in heaven. One little bitty verse, verse 17, made into a little child song, could give him stability for the rest of his life. He would never, ever forget that song. He would always know that God is always watching. He would always know that God is the one that hears you when you talk to him privately. <clears throat> These verses, listen, they, they would sing to a child. For it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips so that your trust may be in the Lord. <clears throat> I have instructed you today even you, have I not written to you excellent things of counsel and knowledge that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send to you? Listen, verse 17 through verse 21 would be very, very easy today. Put tunes and tones and sing to it. Excuse me, I got myself a little cold too. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord will plead their case and ponder their soul of those who plunder them. Wow. Wow. It is a promise to good parents that you'll train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he'll not depart from it. That's a promise. The results is having good children chase children too throughout life who mind not only just their parents, but they mind elders. To not face much of the heartache that you will face when your child gets older, you must train him. To keep that child from spending his life in prison, you must train him. To keep him from dying before his time, you must train him. Education is good, and it's nice to see children that have education. But education without God is not a good thing, and sometimes it causes a person to think that he's smarter than God if he doesn't have God directing that education. So train up. That Hebrew word is chenek. Chenek. It's like connect. A serious word. It's to put something into your mouth. 
And training up a child, making his heart right, what comes out of his mouth, will be because he had the right chinet. What went in was right, and what comes out will be right. That's where that chaining, training comes in. This word has, as you dig into it, a great meaning. It shows the submission of that one that gets it. You have to submit your mouth and your teeth and your tongue and your throat to connect, to eat, to put in. You have to use your whole body. And you have to use your whole brain to connect education. And you have to use your brain and your heart to connect spirituality. We all have freedom to choose. But in that freedom, we need to put some direction. If we look at the wind, the wind has freedom to blow. Sometimes it blows with a good straight direction and can blow a tree down. Other times it can be a still small breeze. It's all the same wind. But how it's directed is what is the outcome of it. And that's the same way with a child. How he's directed, he will come out. If he's blown about by every wind of doctrine, it won't come out right. I'm going to cross this bridge and then I'll quit. I've mentioned several times the King James Version. The devil has made it today to where some people spurn the King James Version. It is the correct wind from God. All other versions are wild wind. They blow where they want to. They'll blow trees down. They'll blow families out of the water. Some of those versions will say, let a child bring himself up. That's not what this says. This says train up a child the way he should go. You can get some of those versions that say some things so far away from what the Bible says that the devil had to write it. And if it doesn't say King James Version on it, the devil's had his fingers in it. So stick to this book. <coughs> it's not wrong. <clears throat> it is not wrong to stick to the idea that one and one is two. And that two and two is four. And that four and four is eight. If you wrote those three things down and put the wrong answer at the bottom of them and taught that to your child, he would never be able to correct that again in his life. So be careful what book you teach your child from. Because it's an indelible impression. Well, I'm 43 minutes into a 30 minute thing. But that word, look it up, train up. C-H-A-N-A-K. The breaking and bringing into submission of the wild horse. Wow. <laughs> a child is like a wild horse. You've got to bring him in, rope him in, and bring him in. Be careful as you uh, come along in your life with your children, who, who you let influence your children. You are in charge, so be careful. Well, my time has come and gone. My prayer is, is that you ladies will get this Bible, this woman's Bible, get in it, go to 1060, 
page 1060, Proverbs 22, and read the inscriptions written by <clears throat> wise, very wise people in the Bible about how to discipline a child, how to bring him up. in the training of the Lord. You're going to love this. This needs to be first thing in the morning. It needs to be when you're drinking your tea in the afternoon. It needs to be when you go to bed at night. The comfort of this book. The wisdom of this book. The strength of this book. <clears throat> There is strength in God, and there is strength in His book. You need to get in it. Well, I'm going to cut her off, and we'll see you next time. Right. Bye-bye.